Thank you all for being here. <laughs> this is the first talk that we've moved back into the gallery space. Uh, we've been doing talks, two talks a month, um, over in Gardner Hall, usually for the last couple months. Um, we're recording these as well and doing some light editing, putting them up on YouTube. So if you go to our YouTube channel, you can find just a lot of great talks from the last like year and a half. Uh, we've been able to talk to people from California to just kind of spread out all over the place, uh, which has been great, you know, figuring out how to live in the digital space, sort of. Uh, it allows the opportunity for our reach to go a little further. But uh, so, so if you know of anyone that's not able to make it out today to the talk or anyone after you hear it, if you think they'd be interested, you can point them to our YouTube channel and we'll have this talk up there in a, in a couple weeks. Um, my name is Corey Fry. I'm the exhibitions manager here at the Bell Plain. If you haven't had the chance, check out the shows that we have going on right now. This, uh, it, today's the opening day of this show, which is the Frederick Camera Click. Uh, there's the Gaithersburg Fine Arts Association in the East Gallery, right through the doorway there. Uh, photographer Robert Warren is on the second floor in the hallway. And all three of those shows are opening today, so they're new shows. Uh, we still have Carol Williams' exhibition in the side gallery, so if you go through into the East Gallery, it's off to the side. Uh, and then Kimo Williams is up on the second floor, right off the hallway, and that's photography work as well. Um, if you're not familiar with what we do, you can grab one of our magazines or check out the website. We've got lots of classes. Uh, winter classes are up, and we're taking registrations for those, and we're working on spring classes and things as well. So uh, if, if that's of interest to you, you can check those things out. We've got other programming coming up next Friday. There's a, a talk that's a webinar um, with an artist named uh, Geraldine Lloyd, and you can, you can check out how to sign in for that as well. But uh, we really appreciate you being here. I'm really excited about today's talk. Um, I really admire Lisa's work, and I think we're in for a, for a good treat, but I'm gonna read a little bit about Lisa real quick before she comes up, and I'm gonna let her just take things over. Lisa Cook grew up in South Carolina and received a degree in studio art from the University of South Carolina in 1987. In 1990 and 91, she pursued graduate work in computer graphics at George Mason University in Fairfax, Virginia. She continued her fine art studies at the Maryland Institute College of Art, the Corcoran School of Art in Washington, DC, the Art League in Alexandria, Virginia, the Schuller School of Art in Baltimore, Maryland, and the Florence Acad Academy of Art in Florence, Italy. She resides in Burkittsville, Maryland with her husband where she paints and sculpts. She teaches here at the Delaplane Art Center, uh, and uh, she's a registered copyist at the National Gallery of Art in DC, of course. Uh, she considers herself a classical realist, drawing inspiration from the great masters and trying to capture not only the natural form, but the emotional reality as well. So if you would, welcome with me, Lisa Cook. Thanks for coming. I see a lot of familiar faces. It's nice to see. Um, so I thought that I would just talk a little bit about my background and um, mistakes that I've made <laughs> and how some of them have turned into uh, positives and, um, uh, and also my process and, and my teaching philosophy. So um, Corey kind of covered my... Um, background, uh, my degree from South Carolina, which I uh, go Gamecocks, but, um, but they, they did not prepare me for, um, uh, for arts in the sense that they didn't teach me how to hold a pencil or how to, um, how to work uh, as an artist uh, realistically. So I sought out, um, when I graduated, um, artists whose work I admired, and I took classes from them. So uh, I, I studied with Rob Liberace for 
about eight years, and, um, and I became a copyist at the National Gallery. And that may have been one of the best things that I, that I did, because I, um, if you don't know about this program, they let you, they let you come and basically they set up an easel for you and you can spend all this time in front of these amazing um, works of art. And uh, it's like, uh, <laughs> it's very mystical. Uh, you know, I feel like they're speaking to me and I'm, I'm, um, I've become very attached in the space. Um, and I'm learning something specific from every copy that I'm doing. Uh, I've made a lot of bad copies and, uh, and I learned a lot of lessons from them. But like, for instance, uh, the George Stubbs um, painting of a white poodle. Uh, I was trying to learn, really, basically, I was trying to learn how to paint the texture of fur. And so, uh, um, so that was the impetus for, for choosing that one. Um, the the uh, still life. Um, uh, his work, I mean, this is, I think, Melendez. I'm probably really massacring that. But, um, you know, here's a, a mistake I made on that was not having a smooth panel. So um, I could not achieve the results. Not that I might have been able to otherwise, but I tried to approach each painting the way the artist would have. Um, and I can show you some examples where that where I didn't do that and it, and it really failed pretty miserably. Uh, the Aikens, uh, the, the rowing picture on the bottom. So when I was working on that uh, painting, it's very dark because the varnish has darkened the painting over time. And so that was kind of a challenge uh, to try to figure out what his true colors were. Um, but also I, did, I looked up his preliminary drawings for this and he did schematics of the water and the waves and how the perspective of the waves. And, and I must tell you, I was too lazy to, to do that. But it, I, learned, um, I learned by failing on that one, um, not only a further appreciation of his work, but of sometimes what you really, the links to which you would need to go to really depict um, the reflections and refractions in water. Um, this one is a super failure. This is a Boltrofio, and um, uh, you probably know he was a student of da Vinci. Um, and I tried to paint this like John Singer Sargent instead of Boltrofio. Right? I was doing a, a a la prima version of a painting that really needed to be glazed. And so I could not, not not that I would have been able to otherwise, but I couldn't achieve um, the effects that he did because I wasn't using the proper method. So um, that's one, one thing with that one. Um, and then there were, there were some surprises. There's always, um, there's always the challenge of working in a public space and um, and people's comments and um, helpful and, and otherwise. The, the sergeant that I, this one was my first copy. Um, uh, and um, I had a guy come up behind me and say, well, your, your flesh tones, they're, they're pretty blue. They're pretty, and I said, I know, I know, I'm, I'm working on that. And he said, no, I mean it really like rigor mortis. <laughs> and so, so I'm like, yeah, I know. <laughs> I, and then, you know, the next, the next day somebody came in and pointed to it and said, do a, do a glaze in quinacridone magenta. And I did, and it, it definitely helped it. So you never knew who was going to be coming in and uh, what, what help they might offer you. And so it was, uh, it's a tremendous opportunity that, uh, that I was able to take advantage of. Um, uh, and then this was a painting I did a long time ago, um, and I was, I was happy with this painting, um, but I could see after I did it that, that there were a lot of, a lot of problems that I would, I would do otherwise. Uh, I was so enamored of the face that I wasn't paying attention to the surrounding areas. I didn't have enough soft edges, um, and I didn't have 
proper transitions. I thought it was a good study in color and color harmony, but, um, but the surrounding, the area surrounding the face seems like an afterthought. And so that was a, um, that was something I needed to work on. And um, in my sculpture, I had similar issues. So a lot of times the same issues that I would have in drawing or painting, I would have in sculpture, sculptor, sculpture. <laughs> And um, so this is, a, this is a, a sculpture I did a few years ago of, uh, of a model, and I could see that uh, you know, I had maybe too many hard edges, and um, some of the transitionary planes were not, not really there. Um, and, uh, uh, and just, again, I seem to have this sort of obsession with the face, and I wasn't paying attention to the the bust part. It was like I wasn't thoroughly thinking it through. I was just so excited with this part that the rest of it just kind of uh, fell away. Uh, and that's why I've cropped this picture in the way that it is so you don't see how, how I did not address that issue. Um, but I will say here's, a, here's something that happened with this one that was a mistake that ended up being a blessing. <clears throat> More than once, probably several times, I have worked on a sculpture and gotten it almost to a point where I was happy with it and dropped it. Um, stupid, pushing, pushing a cart forward and it, and it falls over. Um, and I did that with this one. And when I did it, uh, it changed the orientation a bit. And I, and I actually found that by tilting her head upwards, I was getting something that I didn't get when she was when, before. And so it actually ended up strengthening the piece. Um, and I've also done, I did a piece of um, a portrait bust and the hair was really big. And even though I thought I had engineered it correctly, the back of the head fell off. <laughs> and um, uh, you know, that's alarming. Um, <laughs> But I decided to make it a high relief. And, and so I went into a series of uh, high reliefs because in all honesty, most people don't look at the back of a portrait bust anyway. And so I could turn it into something that was uh, a wall hanging. And, um, uh, and so that set me off down an, another path. So, um, uh, and then this, this was a, <clears throat> a relief that I did along the same time period I was exploring uh, Greek mythology. Um, and I was, I was somewhat happy with some of it. I don't, I don't think there are, there are areas that are not working well, but on the whole, the same issues kept cropping up for me, which was that my transitionary, uh, the spaces between the large planes were not subtle enough. And, and some things had more of a um, harshness or a uh, lack of subtlety. And so um, uh, this is sort of gnawing at me. Yeah. This is another example of one of, the, one of the portraits that turned into a high relief. Um, and, and with this one, um, uh, originally I was gonna just do it as a mask, but I decided to, uh, um, explore this idea of Greek mythology, and so she she became um, one of the Melissa. I'm sure I'm, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, even though my name is Melissa. Um, uh, the Greek goddesses of beekeeping, and um, and so uh, part of what's fun about sculpture for me and painting is that you have to solve a new problem every time. And with this one, I needed to depict, um, you know, like a comb. Um, and so uh, I found that the end of a pencil uh, was the perfect shape to, uh, to make this pattern. And then the bees, uh, I ended up just hand carving those out of, out of wax um, because I tried looking for molds and all of that, but that was a case where it just, you just, I just had to individually do them. Um, uh, these were two more pieces from that same series. Um, uh, maybe I, I feel personally the Bacchus uh, as uninvited house guest was maybe the one, the most successful of that uh, series. Um, 
I brought Apollo in to talk about that a little bit because I can point out some areas where I would certainly change it. And it's a head on a spike, right? It's a, it's a head on a spike. And even though I think there are some exciting things that are going on in the face, um, I would mount it differently and I would pay a little more attention, perhaps give him a sternomastoid muscle. Um, so, so anyway, I started feeling like it's time to go back to school. And I, I searched around for places that could, could take my sculpture a little bit further. And I ended up in Florence. And uh, they have a very specific method that they follow. And so, um, so we spent, um, we spent an, a very, um, like one drawing you would spend maybe 45 hours on. Right. Well, that's not going to happen. In, in the real world, you're not going to have access to a model for that kind of a time period. And um, I mean, it was a, a beautiful luxury to be able to do that. Um, but, uh, but you have to adapt those uh, methods to the real life when you get back. Um, this was a half life size that I did um, working with, uh, with a model for five weeks, um, five days a week. Um, and um, this, this kind of shows, I don't know if you can tell here, how they start out a piece, which is everything is done in silhouette, um, almost like a flat, um, almost like a relief, basically. And um, so you make a decision based on what the silhouette is, and then you turn it and you build out from there. Um, and they start with a sculpture, they start with the pelvis and the rib cage, and everything is built up from that. So this is a, an example of the beginning stage. It's a little bit hard to make out on the slide, but the thing that they uh, sort of drill into you is keeping track of the tilt <clears throat> of the shoulders and the pelvis and the center line. Um, uh, heavy emphasis on anatomy, and this is a drawing that um, was five weeks, five days a week, um, uh, with five different instructors giving you input. So, um, uh, and uh, this was another beginning of a sculpture. So, so they don't even think about the head until the last part of it. And then this was, I did have, I was in their sculpture program, but I, I knew I wanted to avail myself of their, their uh, painting uh, because uh, um, their painting is basically um, tonal in nature. <clears throat> the founder is, is a big fan of Velasquez and Ribera and, and all those uh, guys, so the palette is very specific. But they were they're able to do something that I wasn't I wasn't able to do, which is they find those transitionary tones, and um, so I did take um, some painting classes when I was there. <clears throat> but I'll tell you, the first year that you're there, uh, you're you're drawing casts, um, and uh, they don't even you don't even get into a figure until you're pretty good at all the. Uh, transitions on a, on a cast. So, um, so basically, uh, I, I, I was um, happy with some of the work that I was doing there. I did a self-portrait. This is the really bad mold that I made that, um, that was shipped back and, and didn't do well in the transit. Um, and then my last, the last project I was working on was starting to get into life size and, um, uh, and this is so, so again, it begins with this very strange looking um, box and egg, and then it's you are building up walls and then filling in in between. Um, and this is where it stood. And then we know, you know, March 2020 came along, and um, I had to get on a plane and leave everything behind. And so um, I was very sad. <laughs> But um, 
uh, I think everyone I know did self-portraits, um, you know, between March and uh, December of 2020. And so, um, so, so did I, because I didn't have access to models anymore. And, um, and I did try, you know, I'm, I found myself trying to incorporate what they had taught me and to try to continue with those exercises. And, um, um, and of course, being nostalgic for Florence, I, I did some um, painting of the, of the city. Um, uh, and then, I, then George Floyd happened. And, um, and I just wanted to touch very briefly on the fact that uh, as an artist, there are, there are certainly um, struggles, financial struggles and, and uh, existential struggles. But one of the, one of the things that um, I think has served me as an artist is because when something happens that I can't seem to process or that I have this overwhelming grief over or, or um, then, you know, I picked up my watercolors and I did something that um, helped to get that out of my body so I could function. Um, and then you find out sometimes that that thing that you did, which you really did for selfish purposes, can connect with someone else who's also feeling the same way. Um, and so, uh, so I started, you know, trying to get back into drawing, and um, and now now I feel like I'm starting to get a little bit more of a handle on hard and soft edges and transitionary planes and uh, more subtlety. Um, and this is this is uh, one of my recent drawings of a model that I work with, and. Um, Another thing I think all of us have been dealing with is Zoom. <clears throat> and so I was doing a um, demonstration over Zoom for an art group in um, Pennsylvania. And it went horribly, horribly wrong. <laughs> the, um, the, uh, the technical aspects of it meant that I couldn't, ba she was, she was uh, they could see her and they could see me working but I couldn't, I, I can only see her in a space like this. And so I was trying to draw off of a space like this. And um, anyway, it went really, really, really poorly. And um, so I set up an appointment with the model to Zoom, uh, you know, just so I could finish, so I could redeem myself basically <laughs> and prove to myself that I was, uh, I still could draw. And, um, and I have to say for the models that they were the first ones to, to understand what situation we were in. And they set up Zoom sessions and many of them came up with wonderfully creative themes. And, um, and this model, uh, Gazelle, is one of those models. And so, um, so for those of us who felt very isolated, um, there was there were opportunities to continue to work when we couldn't be in person, um, and then I then I also wanted to touch briefly on how important teaching has been for my growth as an artist, um, because not only is the exchange between um, my students and I, um, so, you know, uh, like a lifeline. Um, because I have to present the material to them, it, 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 I have to re either relearn it or learn how to articulate it in a manner that makes me better as an artist. Um, I'm doing research, I'm, uh, you know, I'm trying to help them solve particular issues, and, it, and I'm doing demonstrations. Uh, these, these are all from demonstrations in class. Um, uh, and you can see from the top portrait that I was, uh, I'm kind of, I was influenced by a copy that I had done at the National Gallery. So, so that sort of always crops back up. Um, but the, uh, being in a classroom with, with students and what they bring to it and, and what we exchange in that community is, uh, 
has been as much of a contributor to my, my progress as an artist as anything, I would say. Um, so, um, so I thought I would just step through a couple um, slides of how I set about doing a drawing and a sculpture. Um, and this, is, uh, this would be like a stage one, um, just blocking it in with, uh, with charcoal that I keep very, very sharp. Um, so I don't, if, uh, I'm, I'm working with nitrum charcoal generally, and I, <clears throat> I sharpen it to a point that looks like it, uh, basically it, it's lethal looking. It's so sharp. I mean, you have to keep the, and, and it's, um, it's, it's a key because you can control the charcoal much easier when you're, when you're working like that. Uh, although it doesn't look like it here. Um, this would be a stage two, where I'm just starting to map in some of the shadow areas. Uh, and then a stage three, where I'm um, putting in some of the darker areas. I'm also using a brush, a, a bristle brush, to, to blend these in <clears throat> and get rid of the, the noise or the static areas like uh, in between. Uh, and again, I'm, now I'm sort of taking the bristle brush and going over the whole thing to, uh, <clears throat> to get a mid-tone and then pulling out some lights and putting in darker areas. Um, continuing with the contrast and with each of these stages, I'm still correcting proportion. So uh, that's one thing I always emphasize to my students is that the first stage, you're just getting something down and it's wrong. Uh, and then you just make many, many, many steps in trying to um, uh, get it sort of closer, which is very similar to how sculpting goes for me. Uh, and then, so I use uh, uh, paper towels, I use uh, stumps, I use uh, pencil erasers and kneaded erasers. Uh, uh, some compressed charcoal, but most of it is done with um, with the medium charcoal. And um, trying to, you know, find the balance between um, between hard and soft edges and and uh, what I want you to focus on and uh, composition and uh, texture. Okay, for sculpture, um, uh, this is clay that I did of my husband during also, so no, no models, so that meant that my husband was the only person I had access to. And um, he's not, he was very gracious to model for me, but he is not a professional model. And so, um, uh, so, but he was, super nice to do it. So this is the, this is the finished bronze, and I, I brought it in um, because I wanted to talk a little bit about this process because it's the first bronze that I've done. Um, I've, I've always worked in terracotta, and that was another reason why I wanted to go to Florence because I, I wanted to venture into bronze. Um, um, and boy, did I not know how much work bronze was. <laughs> It's so it's just so much more work. Um, so now I'm here and I don't have access to uh, the instructors in Florence, so I decided to try to find an apprenticeship. And, and I contacted Brian Booth Craig, who is in Pennsylvania and a very uh, accomplished, um, amazing figure sculptor. And so we set up some apprentices and I went up and um, in exchange for a lot of um, uh, dog walking, tool cleaning, mm -hmm. uh, meal pre preparation, uh, studio cleaning, uh, he taught me how to how to really properly make a mold. And uh, so this is the first stage of the mold. Um, and uh, this is his amazing studio. <laughs> And we did about three coats of that, and then we put um, the keys on. So he has a cabinet maker who makes, uh, you know, a, a, a mold, and then then you pour these uh, 
these keys, and they're, they're, they're placed on it with pins. Um, and then the shims, which are made from soda can, um, cut up. And then we, um, then we did the, um, the outer mold, which is rosin. Um, and we, um, so if anybody here has, has sculpted, one of the things that he did that I thought was a very cool trick was he puts magnets in the, in the mold. And um, that way, so I don't know if you can see the magnets are here, but they're, they're like heavy duty magnets. And then they're also embedded in, the, in this. And so when I place it in the, um, in the mold, it really uh, clicks it in. Um, and it's, it's just a, it's, it's a nice trick. Um, and then we, we had to pour the wax. Um, it's, a very, it's a specific wax. Uh, and then um, we demolded it. Um, and there were little bits of rubber all caught in it that we had to um, pick out, or I had to pick out. Um, and I had to use the tool to remove the seam from the wax um, and try to blend it in with the texture of the hair. Um, and uh, fill in some, some little holes um, almost like soldering um, in a way. And then there's a softer wax that you can fill in smaller areas of, of uh, holes. This just shows you, then I'm cutting out the bottom of the head. Um, and all those little white areas are, are areas of the mold that have to be picked out. Uh, and then this would be, the, this is like the wax before I was um, sending it off to the foundry. Um, so, you know, a fair amount of time in the mold making, a fair amount of time in the wax, uh, um, you know, getting rid of seams and finding, you know, I thought, I thought my clay looked pretty good and then I get it back in the wax and I see that there are things that don't look good and now I'm going to have to actually do a little bit more sculpting in the wax. So, uh, and then this is the raw bronze that, ca that comes back from the foundry. Um, <clears throat> and I had to, uh, uh, I had to sort of make, uh, widen the area that uh, we were going to weld so that the weld would take properly. Uh, he did the welding, but, you know, I, I looked over his shoulder. Um, and so you have this big area here that you have to get rid of. And uh, you can see here and there. And so I had to uh, use a variety of different tools to basically um, grind down and then um, uh, retexturize that area of the bronze. And, um, you know, while I was doing this, my little, my little tiny head, he was working on a life-size bronze in the, in the studio beside me. And um, uh, things were distorted and he was having to re, he was having to basically uh, bend and manipulate the bronze after it comes back from the foundry to get it to go together into one piece. It was so much work, um, you know, and, and you know, so he's having to, anyway, put holes in and put a bolt in and, and uh, you know, get a winch and, and uh, all I had to do was put the little cap back on. So, um, so it was, uh, and still, I thought I, I thought it was a tremendous amount of work. So then we have the the finished bronze, and these are some of the tools. Um, and then the fun part really was the was watching him do the patina. It's it's in a way like um, like when you're glazing a painting or varnishing a painting, and it's you're you're finished, but then it just gives it it has that pop after you um, varnish it. So. Um, so he, he showed me, whoops, he showed me how to uh, do the patina work on it. Um, and, and then this is the actual terracotta piece. So because he built the mold pretty well, um, the clay was still intact when we, when we demolded it. And I, I uh, 
I went ahead and fired it, or actually the Delaplane fired the head. And um, so I can, uh, so this is the clay version. Um, and uh, basically, um, just like I used to do, I, I, I finished the, the clay version in a way that simulates bronze, um, but uh, is not as much work. Um, but of course, the disadvantage is if I ship it, it can get broken, and people, um, and for the most part, really want bronze. Um, but you can get uh, something that, that simulates the effect of bronze. Uh, so, um, and then I brought in a piece that I'm working on now, which is, um, which is done in oil-based clay, because now I'm shifting to oil-based clay instead of uh, water-based. Um, and I am trying to start um, considering more than just a head on a spike. Uh, so for this one, I am going to be trying to do a, um, more of a, uh, um, you know, a torso. Um, this piece, I don't know if, I don't know if, you, Doug, you weren't in that portrait class, were you? It st also started out as a demonstration piece because she modeled for the class. And um, I had just told the class, please don't ever push your sculpture cart away from you because you will, it will tip. And then 15 minutes later, I pushed my sculpture cart away from me and my piece went down. And, um, uh, and Gazelle had a great analogy because I kept trying to work on it in class because it was a demo. But it's like when you've wrecked your car and the frame is off. So I, so I spent too much time trying to get back to it. And this, this is the second iteration. The clay, the water-based clay version um, fell twice. And so I said, hmm, I think I'm going to, uh, I'll start over completely and, and work in oil-based clay. And, um, uh, and so I'm, I'm still working on it because, um, I found that um, I didn't have uh, the proper proportion on her, um, where her ears were placed and stuff. And so, um, so Brian <clears throat> taught me um, that if you're gonna set up a portrait, you, the tragus, which is the place right in front of the ear, uh, you take a measurement there, like, there's a lot of theories about not doing too many measurements with sculpture, but if you take a measurement here for the width and then measure from the tragus to the tip of the nose, then you've got the, the depth, and then measure from the tragus to the brow ridge and the tragus to the chin, which is basically a triangulation. It's a Lynn Terry method. It's been used for a long time. It can give you kind of like the canvas that your painting is going to fit on and you can avoid um, creating a face that starts off small and just keeps getting like Mount Rushmore, it just keeps growing. Or the other thing, which is a very common thing, is the armature will, you'll run into the armature and you'll have to slice off the front of it and shift it forward so that your armature has uh, space. So, um, so those are things that, uh, that uh, I've been trying to implement now. And, and <clears throat> so I had spent all this time on her hair because I thought I was getting close to being done. Um, so I don't know if you can see, but I was doing individual braids of the hair. But now all that has to be covered up because she wasn't really, she, she needs more, more cranium. So this is um, an example of, um, I, I don't say, say I was getting into detail too quick, but, um, Maybe I should have figured out the proportion issue before I got into that level of, of uh, hairdo. So, um, so anyway, um, I can show you, I think, I don't know, I think that's, uh, I'll show you just a really brief little thing on how I do, a, how I set up a painting, and then I can, if you have any questions. Um, so, um, so basically on the panel, I just rub it down with, uh, uh, gam, you know, uh, turban weight or whatever, 
And then I'm using a um, um, burnt sienna to sketch it in. <clears throat> I don't do like a super detailed charcoal sketch for a painting. Um, uh, and I'm using a turpentine to wipe out areas. Um, you know, so that cat just completely disappeared because it was wrong. And uh, uh, and so it's 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 basically drawing. Um, and then um, changing the composition around a little bit, and then I start. Then I'll start um, putting in a little bit of color. And I think, yeah. So I'm I'm adding, working in on the background first before I. Uh, put the cat in, and um, it's it's hard to tell from this, really. Yeah, but just look with the sculpture. This is this is what I'm doing now, but two weeks from now I might have a different um, approach, right? Uh, in Florence, they taught you to only start from the side and to build up these walls. And, and I, I did that, but now I learned in the apprenticeship that I need to also do this triangulation thing. And so I'm, I'm, I'm very leery of any kind of dogmatic approach. Uh, and, uh, and I'm very um, big on learning from as many people as possible and then taking what serves you best because, um, uh, you know, who cares how you get there? Uh, as long as you get there, it doesn't matter. There's no, um, you know, there's so many different valid approaches. So, um, uh, so basically, um, you know, I used to do a, a, a mid-toned background and have my palette toned the same tone. I've done, I've gone through many iterations, but, uh, uh, but now I just start on a white canvas. Um, so that's about, I think that's about it for that one. So, um, so thank you for, for <laughs> showing up. I really appreciate it. Um, <laughs> Did you want to take questions? Oh yeah, if anybody's got a question, yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Hey. Oh, hey. hey. <laughs> hey. <laughs> difference for you in working from water-based clay to the oil-based clay? Mm. Well, one of the reasons I had avoided the oil-based clay for as long as I did, well, A, it's very expensive. It's, it's really expensive. Um, but B, I couldn't, water-based <laughs> clay, it's very um, easy to get a, a, a nice skin texture. I mean, it's, it's easy to work with. Um, and, and the oil-based clay seemed to be a little bit harder to work with to get a smooth surface or to get the kind of texture that I wanted to get. But, uh, you know, working with Brian, he showed me how to, how to get those things. And a lot of it is using, I mean, it's, this is citrus solvent that you get at the hardware store and some water and some oil-based clay and you make a slip in the same way that you make a slip in water-based clay with just clay and water. With this, you, you just use that citrus um, solvent in the clay, and you can get the same effect that you can with, uh, with the water-based. And so it's also great because I can leave it out. I don't have to worry about it drying and cracking. And um, so it's, um, and if I were gonna do a figure, that that was in some you know strange uh, pose uh, I could do it in the oil-based clay and leave it out and, and I wouldn't have to you know it's just um, in some yeah, yeah, well, longer to work with it. yes right, right. Okay. yeah so, so, so that's the real advantage is, is that it's almost like working with oils or acrylics in painting you know it's like oil you can push them around for a while yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, it's very similar to that. Yeah. So now, so I think for what, I mean, I'm still going to work with water-based clay and fire pieces and all that because there's no way I can go through this bronze process every time. I can't. Um, but, um, and also, you know, um, 
I like doing, um, right now I'm trying to explore sketchier pieces that are looser, and I think that um, terracotta is gonna, is gonna be a way for me to explore that for a while. Uh, but I think for bigger pieces, I'm, I'm, I'm shifting to oil-based clay now, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know, he, used, he uh, also like pieces of uh, screen for texture, and um, um, anyway, lots of little basically technical insider tips that, that, that uh, made me realize that actually I could get the effect that I wanted with it, so. Yeah. It's just a different medium, and so there's just different ways of working with it that you're just not familiar with. Right, exactly. It's another, absolutely, yeah, another, another, um, another um, challenge. But, but so far I'm liking the way it's, uh, and tools, you know, he, he also showed me the proper tools for, for, for using on something so they're, like they're, that. They're, they're different, you know? I think so, yeah. I mean, some of them I've also used on clay, but um, um, it's just, uh, that's I think the big value of studying under all these different people, because, um, uh, you know, even if it's just one thing like that, like knowing about the solvent and, the, and this slip, that's a, that's a game changer, yeah. so. It seems to be like learning about a lot of things is like that. I mean, if you're learning a language, it's kind of better if you're doing it through different, you know, th th this book, you know, and then this series of tapes, whatever, you know, but if you, you get, you know, input from different sources, you know, and I think with painting, you know, and get, hearing different pe pe people's approaches. I think so. It's more interesting. It's it like absolutely you know, does. It's yours, too, because you're, you, you personally you know, have this specific person's input and this, you know, you know, so it's right. your own little group. Yeah, and you find what, what, what works for you yeah. specifically. So yeah, no, I, I'm, uh, I'm um, deeply indebted to him for, for the way that he has shared his knowledge with me. Yeah, it's, it's good, it's good. I think it's gonna take, um, take me to the next step that I need to get to, so yeah. Thanks for that. Yeah, yeah. hi. Um, did you pour the uh, rubber mold, or did your um, mentor teacher do that? You mean, um, I, I did the, uh, he, I was with him, but I didn't trust myself, and I don't think he trusted me either, to do it, uh, um, to do it all completely on my own. So when I go back, I'll, I'll do it, and he'll be in the room. <laughs> My question is, um, did you have to, because you get a lot of air bubbles with that. I don't oh, know yeah. if they had a degasser for it or something like that. He does have a degasser, but what he showed me was uh, those, uh, those spray bottles that you use to get rid of the dust on your computer or whatever. I, I took that and I, sh I didn't take pictures of just that. Just the air? Just completely? Yeah. Air. So I sprayed that, especially like into the areas of the eyes and, and all around the mold, especially on the first layer, of course. And that pushed that in and got rid of the. Yeah, so that's another very, you know, very simple. Um, uh, hack, I guess. There's a lot of traps, a lot of air traps. I was looking at yeah. it earlier and saw all the air traps. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. So, so how long did you let it set up before you spray it with that? I think we did that pretty much right. Oh, right like, away. Yeah. It, it doesn't move it around. It's just pushing it. Yeah. And you don't get mm -hmm. splatter from it? It's splatter. No, because it's, it's, a, it's a fairly gentle, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then the magnets are also another great hack that he, that he, um, uh, so, so he was, um, he was, and, and, um, and the, you know, I mean, he knows the kind of wax. He, he sent it to the foundry for me. He, um, and, uh, you know, I don't know that I should share this, uh, but, <laughs> but this, this guy uh, was only $150 in, in, in getting it from the foundry. Um, as that's because all they did was the casting. I, we, we did everything else. And, um, and that's the only way I can afford to do bronze is, is as a cast only situation. Uh, now it means that you have to do all this other stuff, but also learning from him, if you allow the foundry to do all that other stuff, they, might, they don't really care so much about your piece as you do 
and there, you know, like, like I, I, there were things that I saw that I wanted to correct or move around or whatever, or like with him having to really majorly move things. Um, I don't think he would have wanted the foundry to handle that uh, because, for instance, there was something on, the, on the, the, the thigh area on his that had to, that was distorted. And his knowledge of anatomy is so much that he can fix that and, and it looks right. But let's say somebody at the foundry that tried to fix it and it wasn't right. Well, then, you know, then that's Brian's reputation when it's, when it's put out there. So, um, so I, I understand the need both financially and also for the control to do all of the steps other than just the pouring of the bronze. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so. Anything else? Yeah, yeah. Do you think you'll ever do another bronze? Oh yeah, no, I'm 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 gonna do a figure. This does sound like so much work. I'm just wondering. <laughs> it's it's an extraordinary amount of work, but um, uh, but I believe uh, yeah no I'm I'm not done with it. I'm I'm uh, I'm and and I'm and I feel like I'm never gonna have the kind of setup that he has. But what I'll do is go up there and work with him on, on those aspects of it. Like, I'll, eventually I'll get to the point where I'm, I'm good at making my own molds, and I'll just go up and use his uh, area for the welding and the uh, patina and all that stuff. Um, so, but yeah, no, I mean, it gives me a total appreciation for, for, um, for bronze and... Um, um, but yeah, no, I'm going to do some figures, and uh, I don't know, I think it'll be a little while before I t try to tackle a life size, but uh, this, was, this was all part of the goal, I guess, yeah, so, yeah. So you going to go back to Florence? I, that's a good question. Uh, right now, my parents are in a, in a fairly bad way, so I can't, I'm, I'm here for, for, the, for that. Um, I, I do think I'll, you know, right now there's Italian books in my car. <laughs> I'm trying, trying to learn the language, um, and I've, I would like to go back, yeah. I'd like to go back and also uh, do some marble carving, because um, that's another, I, I feel like maybe I've got ADD. I, I'm sort of all over the place. That's a whole other It is a whole other, it's, yeah, it's a whole, absolutely. Yeah, it's the opposite. It's, it's, yeah, so um, uh, I need to focus on this for a little while, and, and I'm in a situation where I need to stay put anyway. But yeah, no, I, I eventually plan to, to try to get back. Yeah, yeah, I hope so. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, no, so. So thank you for... <laughs> <laughs>